welcome all of you in the last class we started discussing about a different two dimensional experiment called 2d inadequate this is the experiment used to correlate two dilute spins this is completely different from other type of experiment where we were correlating homonuclear spins or one homonuclear other heteronuclear spin would be both abundant and dilute there were other type of toxic expecosi hsqc hmbc experiment in this 2d experiment or inadequate experiment we are correlating dilute spins and this pulse sequence is a very simple sequence which i told you it is a spinnaco like sequence followed by the evolution of the magnetization double quantum evolution and then we apply 90 degree pulse convert them to single quantum and then after filtering to double quantum collect the single quantum and detect the carbon 13 while decoupling proton and each carbon uh, you know to be two carbon present simultaneous simultaneous as carbon 13 is probability is 1 in 10000 so, uh, so the double quantum is just sufficient maximum we can see two carbons more than that what what happens is very very difficult quite unlikely so what we will do is we will do the double quantum filtering and the spectrum is very easy to interpret we saw that when you get a spectrum of course there are various things to discuss you start with one of the peak confident that you know that is a cross peak go what vert what vertically down that is the same chemical shift or horizontally meet another cross peak that correspond to the chemical shift of the other carbon like that you go ahead and then trace the complete carbon skeleton of the molecule and i started analyzing one of the spectra in the last class it was a, we were in a hurry we will repeat that and then continue from the uh, from this uh, spectrum again okay coming back to this this is the inadequate spectrum i in the previous class we analyzed this proton spectrum and multiplicity rated carbon hsqc etc in the 2d i i have drawn a diagonal here which i said is a pseudo double quantum diagonal and each cross section pertaining to f1 dimension pertains to some of the chemical shift of the two coupled carbons it is a double quantum dimension you have also the some of the chemical shifts and this one in the detection dimension come vertically down you will get only corresponding chemical shifts single quantum chemical shifts that's how it is so what we will do is this molecule we will quickly go through and in the proton we have already assigned that's as h7 and carbon 7 from h from h multiplicity related hsqc also we know it is carbon 7 and if you carefully see each of them is a doublet i told you because they are all ax spin system two carbon present the couple they form ax spin system so c7 go horizontally you are going to hit a peak and then that is carbon 6 of course you can c7 you can also come down here i'll see that you can also hit another one now come vertically down hit a cross peak of course the same cross uh, uh, chemical shift correspond to the same carbon you have to go horizontally again then you hit a peak that correspond to carbon 5 go in the same chemical shift go up go horizontally you hit a peak that is c10 because you are going like this okay started with c7 c6 c5 c10 and then if you go further from c5 you go vertically up or c10 vertically up and here come horizontally you will see another peak that is c4 then you come down go horizontally again you get carbon 3 from carbon 3 come down go horizontally you get carbon 2 see started with 7 6 5 10 4 3 2 everything we assigned afterwards we are ending with a nitrogen we cannot get the peak so there is a dead end here it reaches the end but what about the other carbons here we have to assign this also we can come from 7 again or from 10 from 10 also we can establish the correlation but if you carefully see here from 10 from 7 you can come horizontally come vertically down horizontally it is coupling to other one this has to be c8 come vertically you will hit another carbon this has to be c9 so when there is a dead end here because of the other heteroatom sit sitting in the, in the molecule we can you start from other point 
So finally, all the carbon skeletons could be traced out. Of course, you can also from C10 you can come down. C10 correlates for not only C5, C9, and C4. It, it correlates to many things. Okay. Now from C9 you can go back, and then you can hit C10. Okay. So either way you can do come from either of the direction. So this is how the structure of the molecule. We can get the complete carbon skeleton. Just we adapted two thick uh, two dimensional experiment like COSI, HSQC and HMBC got the complete carbon skeleton of the molecule. We assigned proton everything. Of course, we didn't assign nitrogen in O2 because we have not done the nitrogen 15 NMR. <laughs> okay. Let us start assigning this molecule. How we can utilize inadequate to get the structure of this molecule? This is the 1D spectrum, proton spectrum. Very clearly you can identify this is proton 1 because this is terminal group attached to C double bond O and no other coupling and isolated singlet that is proton 1 is CA3 very easily we can do and of course these two correspond to ring protons typical pattern expected for a benzene ring that is true and of course one more is there which is uncoupled a singlet it has to be OCA3 coming in the methoxy region. Then we have two uh, CH2s. Of course, each of them is a triplet. This is giving to making this triplet. This is making this triplet. So we got two triplets here. So basically, looking at the proton spectrum, only one D spectrum itself, just sufficient for you to make the assignment. See, all these things have been clearly assigned. Which group is which? We assigned CH3O, CH2, CH1, everything. Okay. Carbon 13 NMR you can do. We can as already assign few protonated peaks and non protonated peaks. All these low intensity peaks, they are all corresponding to quaternary carbons. We can easily make out. And these are all protonated carbons from the benzene ring. And this, these are all other protonated carbons. Very easily you can make out. Okay, to make it very clear, let us start with multiplicity edited HSQC spectrum of this molecule. If you do multiplicity edited, you can see two of them are red in color, negative peaks. Obviously, they correspond to two CH2s. We could see that two CH2s, each of them is a triplet, they are coupled between the themselves, and there is no other long range coupling for that. There are different isolated spin systems in this molecule. So, if you look at it, we are uh, that is con confidently we can start with H1, then we know H1 C1. This is H3, C3, H4, C4, and all those things. So the methyl HSQC confirms. Okay, there are three and four are CH2 carbons here, and rest are all CH and CH3 carbons. And there is also a quaternary carbon here. You don't see it in the HSQC, but in the 1D carbon 13. If you look at it here, 202, 208. That is a quaternary carbon pertaining to carbon 2. Okay. That carbon 2 also correlates to proton 5, um, carbon 5 and carbon 8. So, that, there are 3 things, I am sorry, that is not, not carbon correlating. Uh, this is one carbon, another carbon, other carbon. 3 carbons, non proton are there, which are present here. C5 and C8, you can see here C5 and C8. C8 will not correlate to anything because it is a CO carbon. Similarly, these two are also, is not carbon. But in the carbon 13 dimension, we are seeing all the peaks. This is the inadequate spectrum. Of course, if you draw a horizontal line here, you can see it pseudo diagonal, you can get it. Fine. Now, what we will do, you will start the assignment. How do you make the assignment? First of all, we should know confidently one peak, which we, we are sure of that. C double bond O is at 208, correlates to C3. C and C1, where is 208? It is here. See, it is correlating to C3 carbon, correct? This one, C3, and also it correlates to C2. What does it tell you? It tells me that this correlation puts C double bond O between these two. Okay? This gives us a group like this. I, and I can start thinking C double bond O is giving correlation strong correlation to CH2 and CH3 I guess this must be the group 
ओके वील कंटिन्यू फादर एंड सी दैट ओके एंड आफ्टरवर्ड्स यू विल सी सी थ्री इज कार रिलेटिंग टू सी एच टू आलो कार रिलेट टू सी फोर सी थ्री इज देर सी एच टू दिस कार रिलेट टू सी फोर दैट मीन्स दिस फ्रैगमेंट यू आइडेंटिफाइड सी ओ वॉज अस्यूम टू बी बिटवीन दीज टू नाउ दैट विल एक्सटेंड दिस फ्रैगमेंट लाइक दिस बिकॉज सी थ्री इज आलो कार रिलेटिंग टू सी फोर हियर go up, go horizontally vertically you will see hit c4 that tells me not only c double bond was here and because this is ch ch3 is correlated to c4 this ch2 proton correlating to this one now this extend this to be the group so this is the fragment now all right we'll go further the ch3 carbon c4 also has a correlation with the quaternary aromatic carbon this one see from here this is c5 quaternary carbon go horizontally you see it is very quaternary carbon you can make out from the intensity also there is a quaternary carbon it correlates to that further the c5 is correlating to carbon 6 a strong peak okay and then it is also correlating to c7 has a correlation with the protonated carbon c8 c7 correlates to c8 here and c8 is this one so most of the carbons started with this one we could assign all the carbons trace it out very easily c6 correlation with c7 c7 correlated to c8 so all this thing and take this thing could be assigned only thing one which is not correlating to anything is c3 carbon because there is no direct attached next carbon next to it that is not correlating to anything else okay that is where is that carbon c9 is here you see it is not correlating to anything there is no carbon next to it attached it is an isolated peak how easily you can assign that carbon here up to this is known and of course oca3 is coming here so this has to be attached to aromatic proton we can assign like that with these assignments now we can get the fragment like this this we got The, and then we extended this, and we know this is correlated to this. This is correlated to phenyl group. So from that we got this one. The remaining is a methoxy, OCA3, which is not correlating to anything else, and it has to be bound to benzene ring at the para position to the other substituents. So that's why it is. So as a consequence, and there is no correlation to OCA3. Also, I told you, is an isolated peak. Okay, as that means. This is attached to the phenyl ring. O C H three is there first O and then C H three. As a consequence, there is no correlation of this H three carbon to any of the phenyl carbons also. So as a consequence, now I can say this is the final structure of the molecule because this O has to be between this and this. Otherwise, there is no. There is uh, otherwise this carbon C H three would have been correlated to this one. This tells me this must be O C H three and this is the structure of this molecule. using the inadequate trace in the carbon skeleton you could get the structure of this molecule we'll go to the next another molecule this is called humulene is a molecule stick we can quickly go through this this is the proton spectrum we have there are three ch3s here 1 2 and 3 there are these are all alkyl chs we have there many chs okay and we have that is h13 and carbon 13 nmr of course this is what we could make rough estimate and many of these things we do not know we have to start make the assignment carbon 13 nmr if you take proton decoupled just by looking at it you can say there are many quaternary carbons lot of them are protonated carbons all these things high intensity peaks are protonated carbons and c6 c13 c2 and c9 c6 c13 of course this are protonated and then c2 and c9 c2 and c9 see these are all quaternary carbons okay we from the intensity you can find out fine if i take the proton decoupled spectrum in the so another solvent cd2 cl2 at 338 k this is what we are going to get we can start making the assignment this is the 3 ca3 sir there
No, four C A three are there. Four C A three are there because there are two C A three here and two here, and there are three C H two are there. No, four C H two are again. Four C H two, four C A three are there, and now four C H S are there. Alka C H S, and the remaining quaternary are there. So we have three C A three, four C H two, four C H S, and three quaternary carbons. We can make rough estimate from this structure from the proton decoupled carbon thirteen spectral. We can start looking at it and say, but how do you confirm it? We will see that later. These are all one group. These are all C A three. These are all C H two. These are all C H S. The remaining are quaternary. Color coding has been done now. Okay, we can identify whether they are C H two or not. Multiplicity edited. Identified four C H two. Four C H very clearly. And it is one point C H two. C H S can also be easily assigned now. So as a consequence, using this one of the carbons, which is very we are uh, sure of that it is a c3 ca carbon coming at the high field and if you look at the intensity that two c3 carbons which are equivalent i would call it as carbon 13 c13 number 13 of this carbon so i can start assigning that c13 and then remaining things we can start making the assignment start once i know that four ch2 the hsqc spectra we have assigned many already Assignment is very fairly simple. We don't need to break our head very easily. I assume that all of you can know, and then we can start making all the assignment for each of them because we know the proton spectrum. A sort of we have an idea about the proton spectrum. Of course, this is a challenge. Molecule is little bigger, but still, with an experience, we can still do it. Well, let us analyze the inadequate spectrum of this molecule. That is more important. Where do you start with? Start with C thirteen. Because we know what where is C thirteen, and what is the C thirteen chemical shift here, based on the proton. So this is the C thirteen peak, which is fourth from the right. Start with that, fourth from the right. That is carbon thirteen. And then go horizontally. You are hitting a peak. So carbon thirteen can correlate only to six now. That is directly bonded. So that is carbon six. You can make the assignment. So after that, you have to come down, and of course, carbon thirteen cannot correlate to anything else apart from that. This is a terminal group; only it correlates to proton six. I mean, carbon six. That is done. Come down. Go horizontally. It can correlate to two things. It can be carbon seven, and it can also correlate to one more thing. If you see, if you come down, that is carbon five. Why did I say carbon five, and why did I say carbon seven? Based on already, I know CH two and CH three from multiplicity edited group, which is CH two and which is CH. Uh, CH. So based on that, I know this CH two has to be there. So then obviously, based on the possible structure, I said this is C seven and this is C five. All right. C thirteen has only one correlation to C six, and now other correlation. C six has one correlation to C seven, a methylene, and to an alkyl CH. That's what we got. So this group is identified very easily. Obviously, because you can clearly see that this one, this C six, cannot correlate to anything else apart from C five and C seven, and to C thirteen. So whole group is identified because of inadequate already. You do that, okay? Now from C five, continue further, go horizontally, vertically up. You are going to hit C four. So we are continuing, and that is an alkyl car C H carbon. That also we know from the multiplicity edited H S Q C. Now we continue further C four to C three, and from C three come down, go horizontally. You are hitting one more peak, that is C two. And C two is correlating to C twelve. Also, C two correlates to other carbon. You see, here C two has two correlations here and here. And this one goes vertically like this. This has to be C11 because C2 is correlating to this and this also. From C like that, go ahead completely. You can make the assignment for all the carbons. I did not 
this, uh, this was the interesting thing. I did it. And rest of the things I did not do that. I was assuming that you can go like this in a stepwise manner. All the other carbons which are here, we can be assigned. Of course, in the previous slide, they were also assigned here. Only these things which you can continue like this and assign. So, all the carbons can be assigned by this in a simple method. This is a 2D inadequate experiment. So, now you got the idea. So far, we discussed about the 2D inadequate experiment. This gives rise to correlation among the couple dilute spins like to carbon 13. So, if you know the correlated peak, simply you have to start from the top, one of the identified chemical correlated peak, come horizontally or vertically down, hit another peak. Horizontally means it is a different carbon. If you come down vertically, the same chemical shift along the axis, F1 axis. And then hit, if you go horizontally, hit another carbon chemical shift that is coupled to that, that is sitting next to that. Come down, come down like that. Keep on tracing all the carbon skeletons of the molecule can be done. So, what you will do? You know, proton chemical shifts by simply using 1D NMR in simple molecules. Little bit complex, use COSI. Even bit complex, use TOXI. You can assign all the protons. And then you have to assign carbons. You can do what is called a HSQC experiment to assign directly bonded carbon proton. All the carbons attached to proton can be identified. If you want to assign the non-protonated carbons, establish long range correlations, then you go to HMBC, do HMBC and do it. After doing all those things, if you need to assign carbon skeleton, which carbon is sitting next to which carbon that is still left, for that you do inadequate experiment. So, combine all the three experiments you can get the complete structure of the molecule. You see, they understand the beauty of this. All you have to do is, you, you have to think which is the experiment you have to do. Do the, do the judicious choice of selecting a particular experiment and then using that and then other couple of experiments make the complete assignment of all protons, carbons present in this. Of course, if some other heteronuclease present like nitrogen or phosphorus, etc., there are all different type of experiment you can think of. But this how with the 2D homonuclear heteronuclear experiments, so far I have told you all correlation things, how do we correlate varieties of things. With this, we will switch out to a new topic now. So far we were looking about, we were discussing about correlation experiments. But remember when I introduced the 2D NMR, I classified into two groups. One is the correlation type experiment, they are all correlation type like what we discussed so far. Other is called resolved experiment. In the correlation experiment, you do not separate the parameters, NMR parameters. You will identify which carbon is coupled to which, which proton is coupled to which carbon, which proton is coupled to which proton like that. You can correlate the chemical shift information. But if I have to separate out the interaction parameters of NMR, like chemical shift and J couplings, if I want to separate out into two dim different dimensions, I can do that. That is called resolved type experiment. So, we will jump into two type of another type of experiment called 2DJ resolved experiment. Okay. And this is the experiment. What it does? I just now said cosy toxic gives you homonuclear correlation, heter HSQC, etc. gives you heteronuclear correlation of couple spin. But J resolved experiment separates the chemical shift coupling interactions into different dimensions. This is the beauty where you can get the you know, resolution much better. Removing the two parameters which are crowded into two different dimensions will help you to get the better resolution. What is the homonuclear 2 dj result experiment? How does it work? What is the pulse sequence for that? This is a pulse sequence. If you look at it immediately, you will know that. We discussed this. This is analogous to a spinnaco sequence. 90 tau, 90, 180 tau. It is similar to spinnaco. So, homonuclear 2 dj J result is nothing but a spinnaco sequence. So, this is the 90 pulse. You apply a TLA, which you call T1 by 2. Apply another 180 pulse, T1 by 2, start collecting the signal. This is a proton, let us say homonuclear, or pro fluorine, phosphorus, does not matter. These are all homonuclear 2 dj J result experiment. Basically, it is nothing but the variation of a spin echo sequence. Here, instead of spin echo, we fix the T1 constant. Here, we can vary it. 
okay the chemical shifts are refocused here like what we discussed in the spinnaco sequence okay always we said homonuclear spinnaco refocuses chemical shifts but couplings evolve here also irrespective of whatever the t1 value you use delay the chemical shifts are always refocused okay how it works we'll take the example of one or two simple cases and see how the j result spectrum comes we'll take the simple example of a doublet ax to ax is a doublet all right we'll consider one of the doublets arx doesn't matter what we'll do first in the pulse sequence what i showed first you apply 90 degree pulse it brings the magnetization to x axis or y y axis give some time what will happen to this parameter two vectors which are coupled j split vectors they start moving in the opposite directions one is fast moving other is slow moving component and how much it moves we also calculated we knew how to calculate theta is equal to pi into t into j that we discussed also long back we know how to calculate if i know the t i know how much it has moved so i i set the par parameter such that after a time t this has moved by j by 2 t1 other is moved by minus j by 2 into t1 in opposite direction both the vector components are moving fantastic let us consider a situation for different values of t1 how much it has moved for t1 equal to 1 over 4 j less than 4 j or equal to less than 4 may not be right thing ok we make it equal to 1 over 4 j then it moves for 45 degree it is less than 4 it is less than 45 ok a spin doublet start moving like that this one moving like this other is moving like this fast moving and slow moving components start spin vectors moving the opposite direction ok what did we do after the delay we apply a 180 pulse like a spinnaco sequence then what will happen depending upon where you are going to apply remember i discussed about the spinnaco if you are applying along this axis you rotate like this if you are applying along y axis you rotate it like a pancake the spin vectors completely rotated like this 180 degree flip so this component came here this component came here give another time delay t1 by 2 they start moving i told you Chem chemical shift will refocus but j coupling will not j coupling start moving in the opposite direction again they start moving they will not refocus that's what happens now what i'm do going to do is i don't fix the t1 constant i vary the t1 when i vary the t1 what will happen that not only the doublet component start moving it processing at different uh, play uh, different time they are started moving at different angle but at the same time their intensity changes because of the strength of the coupling the intensity of the two components the doublet vary as a function of delay and also j coupling strength both are dominating factors this is how it happens pictorially i am considering only a doublet there is one component of the doublet other component fast and slow moving initially it will be like this slowly they go go like this negative 0 and then positive negative 0 and then positive so it forms a oscillating curve like this goes like this both the both the doublet components identically start varying their intensity identical intensity variation from the center of this doublet that is the chemical shift all right how much is the intensity how it is changing as a function of t1 we can find out it is a well known equation that we have been discussing even with the spinnaco sequence i said this so it is cosine of the function and how much is the delay and the j value so you, you all we have to do is intensity you have to take the projection along one of the axis cosine cosine of that angle how much it has moved so you know that and we know how the intensity is varying so in the t2 dimension what is happening this is variation in the t1 dimension i am telling you what is happening in the t2 dimension we still have the chemical shift of J coupling evolution, the conventional one dimensional spectrum that is not getting changed, that continues like that. Chemical shift and coupling continue to evolve. We will do that, we will vary T1 and then fix a T2, collect a two dimensional spectrum like any 2D experiment, 
T1 is varied with the 180 pulse in the middle and then we collect the this thing and do the Fourier transformation. I am considering only a doublet. What will happen? In this dimension, if this is the chemical shift, you have one, one peak coming to the half of j to the right, half of j to the left. This is what we understood for a to coupled spin system. When you have a doublet, a weakly coupled, I told you half of it is half, half this is half j, this is half j, one peak is to the half j to the left, one peak is half j to half j to the right. Center is the chemical shift. That is fine. So, both j is there and chemical shift is there in this direction, in this f2 dimension. But in the, the indirect dimension, chemical shifts are refocused, only j is evolving and does not matter, you make it at the center, from the center you take the frequency, see you will see, see one, uh, if you do the Fourier transformation, this separation gives you j coupling. Fantastic. So, in the indirect dimension, you can measure the j coupling. In the direct dimension, both j and chemical shift are present. All right. For both the spins, now I took only one component of the doublet, I mean one doublet of the two coupled spin. If both are present, what will happen? You see, like this. This is one of the, let us say a spin doublet or x spin doublet, whatever it is. Each of them is a doublet and center of them can use a chemical sheet for both of them and from the center of in the f1 dimension on either side you have a j coupling. So, chemical stuff and j coupling both are present here, here only j coupling and that is how it is. So, in the f1 dimension you do not get chemical shift as they are refocused, this is how it is. So, as the information in two dimensions are different, spectrum is not symmetric that is why analogous to your homonuclear cosy, taxi, etcetera, this is not symmetric because the two parameters are completely different. Here j coupling of the order of 10 to 15 hertz here, here chemical shift in this dimension is of the order of several thousands of hertz. So, you cannot get symmetric spectrum like cosy or taxi they are not symmetric. So, j result spectrum is not symmetric. Okay. Okay, let us let, take another simple example of what is called homonuclear 3 spin couple A x 2. What will happen to A x 2? Now, I am looking at A, A will be at a, because of this it is a triplet that we are splitting pattern we have already understood 1 is a 2 is 1 triplet. We will consider triplet you apply 90 degree pulse bring it to x axis give a delay t 1 by 2 they start moving. Remember I already told you when you are explaining spin echo and j modulation central component of the triplet do not express it is always along the same axis. Only the outer components start moving like this. Okay, one like this, one like this. Apply 180 pulse, again they get reversed and after some time central peak remains same whereas, this one start moving another side and this is what happens. How the evolution of magnetization vector for different values of T 1 happens is like this. Central peak always remains same always focus on the same axis at t is equal to 0 this is what it is at t equal to half j you have anti phase components because they are moved by 90 degree at 1 over 2 j they are moved like this central component is always and not precising always along the same axis. So, intensity of the outer component is the only thing which varies central component do not vary because it is fixed it is not moving, but it can also change in the intensity why because of relaxation this is the intensity identical to what we observed in the double you know true doublet case is moves. So, in the T 2 dimension we still have chemical shift and j coupling. The central peak will not precise and the change in the intensity is only due to relaxation T 2. The two outer components vary periodically as a function of T 1 and strength of coupling like doublet case and this is how the example of a 3 x 2 spin system if I consider this is a triplet because one spin is split by a C H 2 group. This is a quartet split by a C A 3 group. In the case of C A 3 also it evolves similar to C H there is no difference we have understood that in the spin echo sequence this is how it comes this is a chemical shift axis this is the J coupling axis. And further what happens I can do the tilting 
more about this tilting and everything we'll discuss later about uh, what will happen but the, uh, since the time is getting over i'm going to stop here so you understood today what uh, we discussed we discussed lot of things about in inadequate experiment and afterwards i introduced a new experiment called 2d j result wherein we are resolving the two parameters in two different dimensions in the indirect dimension you get the j coupling in the direct dimension you got j coupling plus chemical shift both present why in the indirect dimension you don't get chemical shift because this it is a spinoco sequence homonuclear spinoco will refocus as chemical shifts but j coupling continuity evolve that's what happens yeah, so instead of fixing the delay vary the t1 do a 2d experiment then what will happen the intensity of the doublet or outer components of the triplet both i saw keep varying as a function of t1 and the strength of the coupling the intensity depends upon both so what will happen there is no symmetry in this case because the parameters are different so in the indirect dimension you just get only peaks corresponding to j coupling from the center of the chemical sheet one peak to the right one peak to the left okay and two different cross sections of the t1 dimension in the t2 of course you have both present further we can do tilting and everything i'll discuss in the next class so basically what we do is the homonuclear spinoco sequence we get the j coupling and along one axis and j coupling for chemical shift other axis so we have separated the parameters in a crowded spectrum i can extract only j couplings in from the indirect dimension so this is a biggest advantage which you cannot get it in a crowded spectrum especially homonuclear proton spectrum if you consider homonuclear j couplings there will be enormous complexity at, at times but this j result helps us so this is simple j result experiment there are number of there are hundreds and hundreds of modifications have been done to get this type of information in the variety of 2d experiment we don't have time to discuss everything but only one of these and the heteronuclear experiment and another one or two simple 2d j result experiment i'll discuss in the next class so i'll stop here thank you very much